Well, today we are, uh, we're in part three of this series. Say it with me. It's called Right in the Eye. And um, to be honest, and I, I've mentioned this to a few of you, I kind of debated whether or not to try to do this in a, in a summer because this series, every message is really interconnected to the other messages. Um, really, this whole series is like kind of one big message. Um, but since nobody wants to come to church, especially in the summertime, and, and hear a four-hour sermon, uh, we've broken this up into like six 40-minute segments. Hey, so if you haven't been here for the first two messages, this is part three, um, then you should realize you're kind of walking in in the middle. And uh, if you'd like to get caught up at some point, and maybe at the end of today you go, I want nothing more to do with that. But if, if at the end of this you go, that's interesting, and I would love to get caught up on the first two parts, you just go to our website, okay, at brookviewchurch.com, and click on messages there, and it'll have uh, everything from this series as well as past series. Um, the other thing that's really helpful about this and nice about it is that usually what happens is you're sitting in church and you're thinking, man, like, I really wish my husband was here for this. Or, man, I really wish that my friend from work could, could hear this or be here. I wish my sister in Nova Scotia, you know, uh, could hear this. Because the reality about sermons is they always apply to someone else more than they do to us, right? I mean, you don't, you don't need any of this. I don't need any of this. But we all know somebody who this would be really good for. So you can always, at the end of this, go to the website, uh, click on the messages, find the right message, and then send them a link. Now, next week, as you might have guessed, will be part four. And I want to give you a, a heads up about it. Um, next week, we're going to look at the story of Samson. And, and it's like, it's like really spicy. Um, and, and I just want to let you know, we're not going to avoid any of that. So if, you, if you've been looking for like the perfect Sunday to invite some run from work, this is it. Like, they will not be bored, okay? They will not be bored. They may not agree with all of it, but they will not be bored. So yeah, I would encourage you, yes, invite someone. Second, the second thing is, if you have kids, they probably should be in kids' church next week. And if you have teenagers, you want them in the front row, <laughs> okay? Um, so if you, if many of you were here for part one of this series or you watched it online, and I, I kind of gave you guys a warning for that one. I was like, this is, this is a very disturbing story. In fact, um, and I would, get, I would say most of you, after having heard it, you're like, that, it, that was horrifying. I didn't even realize there was stuff like that in the Bible. It was disturbing. In fact, it was so horrifying that honestly, I, I felt like I kind of needed to summarize parts of it for you. Um, because it's almost like too much for, for church. It'll, it's a story that'll just make you sick. Well, the story of Samson next week, it is very graphic, and it is very spicy, and we're not going to avoid that stuff. So be forewarned. You've been forewarned. Okay, on to today's message. I want to kind of launch us into today's message and today's topic with a question. The question is this. Do, do you really want to be like everybody else? Do you really want to be like everybody else? Like, do you, do you really? Is that really what you want? Do, do you want to have a marriage like everybody else? You want to have relationships like everybody else? You want to have kids like everybody else? You want to, you want to date like everybody else? You want to manage your money like everybody else? Do you want to manage your morality like everybody else? I mean, has there ever been a time in your life where you're like writing down your life goals and you write this down and you say, my life goal is to be like everybody else? I mean, parents, do, do we raise our kids to be like everybody else? And yet the truth is, for, for many of us, much of the time, if we look at our lives, it's like, yeah, we're pretty much just like everybody else. So just for a few minutes, just to get us going, I, I want us to talk about everybody else, okay? So I want to be clear right now. I am not talking about us in this room. Are you with me? I'm not talking about us in this room. Uh, not you. I'm not talking about you. I'm not talking about your family. I am not talking about us because us, we're different. 
Uh, I am talking about everybody else, okay, out there. Are you all with me on that? I need, I need some affirmation. Yes. Are you all with me? Yes. Okay. This is about the people out there. This is everybody else. Here's what everybody else wants. Everybody else wants their life to look like a beer commercial. <laughs> right? Like... Everybody else wants to look good. Everybody else wants to be surrounded by people who look good. They want the sun to shine every day of their lives. They, they, they don't want to have real jobs. They want every day to be filled with excitement. They don't want to get old. They want to have plenty of money. They don't want to have any debt. They don't want to have any worries. They just want to have smiles all the time. Everybody else wants to have their life look like a beer commercial. But it doesn't. It doesn't. Because everybody else is worried. Everybody else is in debt. Everybody else is trying desperately not to turn out like their parents. And the older they get, they get the more they go, oh my goodness, I look just like my dad. I look just like my mom. Everybody else can't really enjoy what they have because they're so obsessed with whatever it is they don't have. Everybody else drinks a little bit too much. Everybody else is taking stuff that you don't even know about. You, you just think like, oh, they're just happy all the time. Turns out they're like, they're like chemically happy. But you don't know that. You're just going, wow, like, man, they seem so happy. I wish I had that kind of joy in my life. And you don't really know. Except every once in a while, they take a little too much, right? Right? And you look at them and they're like, wee. And you think, huh, maybe that's not real. Like, that, that might not be real. But see, everybody else is trying to figure out how to manufacture happiness. In the world of everybody else, the single women are afraid that they're going to be single forever. And the single men are thinking, hey, how come every time I think I found the perfect woman, when I get to know her and we actually get connected, it turns out she's got like serious issues. Turns out she's got insecurities and she's got daddy issues and she's got real issues. So, you know, I got to move on. I, I got to find the perfect woman who somehow stays perfect. Everybody else is, is a little skeptical about marriage. Well, you know, maybe it could work, maybe. But honestly, I've never really seen a, a good one. And in the world of everybody else, the women are worried that their husbands aren't faithful. They aren't sure, they don't know, but they wonder because they hang out with their girlfriends who are kind of suspicious of their husbands. And so it just all seems kind of normal. And in the world of everybody else, the husbands are thinking, hey, maybe life would be better with a little something on the side. Because I got a few friends and, and it seems to be kind of working out for them, it seems okay. In the world of everybody else, every teenager, even though they won't admit it, like you, as a parent you talk to them, they won't admit it, every teenager completely cares what everybody else at school thinks about them. And no matter how many times we try to explain, we try to tell them, honey, like sweetheart, in four years, okay, just four years, these people are just like out of your life. Why would you get up every single day and look in the mirror and think about people that won't even be in your life a few years from now. But in the world of everybody else, that's, that's how high school goes. That's how it has to go. Now again, okay, I hope you're with me on this. None of what I just explained is us. That's not us. I'm just asking, who really wants to be like everybody else? And, and here's the strange thing about all this. It turns out that everybody else is taking their cues from everybody else. And, and here's something kind of obvious. I mean, this isn't rocket science, but if you think about it, if you take your cue from everybody else, you will end up like everybody else. Now, the big problem from taking your cues from everybody else and just doing whatever it is that everybody else does is that when you take your cues from everybody else, and I think deep down we all know this, when we take our cues from everybody else, what we're doing is we're taking our cues from their highlight reel. 
taking our cues from their highlight reel. It's not their actual life. Like, you know that, right? You know that. Because you just see them at their best. You, you only see, like, the peaks in their life. This is especially true on social media, right? But this is true in general. What you see isn't their whole life. It isn't their real life. What you see are the highlights, the peaks. And the only time you really ever get acquainted with somebody's valleys is when it's somebody that's a family member that you can't get away from, right? Or it's a really close friend, or it's a neighbor, and they just keep coming over and telling you about it. And when that happens, when you see somebody else's valley, when you actually see their valley and see them at their worst, what happens is we look at that and we think, well, like, okay, this person has some work to do. Like, this is a mess. But in reality, this is weird. This is unusual. I mean, look at all of the people over there because they all seem to have it together. Because from a distance, like, all you can really see are the peaks. You see the highlight reels. They're smiling, and they're happy, and they're rich, and their cars never get dirty, and they always have a good job, and their family is cute, and everybody gets along. The problem with taking your cue from everybody else is you're always going to be taking your cue from their highlight reel. Because here's what you don't know. You don't know that actually they're in counseling. You, you don't know the, the arguments that they keep having and keep having and keep having behind closed doors. You don't know that actually they haven't had sex in nine months because they just act and talk like it happens all the time. You don't know that in six months he's going to check into rehab. You don't know that three months from now she's going to have a long stay at a psychiatric hospital. You don't know what she's on, just trying to overcome depression or trying to deal with fear or anxiety. You see, you don't see that part at all. We see the highlight reels. And we take our cue from the highlight reels. But what we see on the outside, and we know this, deep down we know this, what we see on the outside rarely reflects the inside. Right? Happy on the outside doesn't mean happy on the inside. But see, we, we model our lives then after people that we're pretty sure are happy. We do what they do. We try our very best to look like them on the outside, do what they do. And then sometimes it's kind of shocking to find it's not working. Like we did it. We did all the stuff that's supposed to make us happy. And in the end, we just end up feeling more lonely and more insecure and more afraid. In fact, for some of you, you, you could look back on like the worst season of, of your life and what you realize is it was a time when you just modeled your life after all the wrong people. They looked happy, right? They looked like they had it all. But if you'd have known what it was really like, if you had known that living like this on the outside would leave you feeling like this on the inside, you would have done things very differently. But nobody told you what it's really like. Nobody told you what it's really like because nobody, nobody talks about this stuff out loud. But if you had known, if you'd only known, if, if only somebody would have told you, if only you could have seen the inside of the people that you were trying to emulate, that you were trying to copy, you would have said, oh man, and you would have ran, you would have gone in the other direction. And that's the problem when you decide to try to be like everybody else. It's not really a conscious decision, though, is it? It's not. You, you don't wake up one day and go, you know what I want? Sweetheart, baby, this is what we need. I want to be just like everybody else. And we don't do that. It's not, it's not conscious. We're not even aware of it. It's just that you look around and you think to yourself, wow, it sure looks like what they're doing is working for them. And so if this has been your story and you've, you've patterned your life, after certain people, and it hasn't really worked out so great, I have some great news. God never intended for you to try to just be like everybody else. God wants something different for you. And here's the really cool thing. It's possible for you. What God wants for you is possible for you. Like regardless of, of 
of who you've been or, or what you've done, it's possible for you. God's not inviting you into something that's like bigger than you. No matter who you are, no matter where you've been, he's inviting you right now into a life that's designed for you. And this is how God operates. This is how God has always operated. Um, in this series, we're looking at the historical period, this historical period in the, in the Old Testament. And um, the reason that it's called the Old Testament is because it's, it's old. I mean, like the New Testament, I love this. The New Testament is how old, approximately? 2,000 years. Okay, the New Testament is 2,000 years old. So like the Old Testament, it's like really old. And we've seen over the last few weeks that the book of Judges takes place during a very unique season in the life of the nation of Israel. Okay, it happened right after about 1380 B.C. So, okay, that's 1,380 years before Jesus. This is really, really old. Um, and many of you, you know kind of the basic story of the Israelites, but let me get us caught up before we dive into these verses today. Moses, he leads the Israelites out of Egypt. He leads them out of slavery, and he guides them through the wilderness for 40 years, and then Moses dies. And Joshua, his right-hand man, is the one who actually leads them into the promised land. So they move into the promised land around 1380 B.C. Okay, and then 330 years later, Israel got its very first king, King Saul, and then came David, and then his son Solomon, and they had... Israel, then they had this whole litany of kings. But in between Joshua leading them into the promised land and the days of the very first kings of Israel was this period that we're looking at, this period of the judges, this 330-year time frame where they had no king. And it turns out that that was by design. That's how God set it up. The way it was supposed to work is that God would be their king. Okay, God would be the king of the nation of Israel. This wouldn't be a democracy and it wouldn't be a monarchy. It would be a theocracy. God gave them his law. He gave it to Moses who gave it to them and they were supposed to follow the law. So they didn't need a human king. God himself would be their king. Now, to live this way, they couldn't just be like everybody else. They couldn't just operate like every other nation. See, every other nation, every other surrounding people group had a king. Egypt had Pharaoh. All of the nations, the Canaanites, and all of them had kings. Israel was supposed to be different. A nation guided by principles and laws and common faith. God would be their king, and they would be his people. So Moses died, and, and Joshua got him into the land, and he, he got them all set up. He got them into their dorm rooms, and they got it all decorated, and, and he got them all tucked into their beds. And then Joshua died. And the people of Israel just struggled. And they would go through this cycle that we've been looking at. They would go through this cycle over and over, and it just it looked like this. They'd start looking around at other nations, looking around, looking around, looking around, and they'd think, hey, hey, we like how they live. We, we like how they worship. We like their gods. Maybe we should live like them. And so they'd disobey God, and they'd ignore his law, and they'd ignore his ways, and then there would be a disaster. And life would get real messy and real hard. And there would be famines, and there would be wars, and there would be captivity to the nations whose culture they had copied. And so they would cry out, God save us, God rescue us, God deliver us, and God would. He'd deliver them. And they'd say, Whew, man, that was horrible. We are never going to do that again. And of course, before long... They were at it again, and soon another disaster, and again they would cry out to God for help, and again he would deliver them again, and they'd say, whoa, that one was really bad. Okay, that was horrible. God, we will never, ever do that again. And this cycle happened over and over and over and over, and it's just mind-numbing. If you read through the book of Judges, it's just like painful. It happened over and over and over, which means that God forgave them 
over and over and over. And what we see is this God who refuses to give up, a God of compassion, a God of mercy, a God who refuses to abandon his people. But the people continually forgot God. They forgot his ways, they forgot his law. And they looked around at the neighboring nations and they thought, look at how wealthy they are. Look at how wealthy they are. Look at, look at how powerful they are. They, they must have powerful gods. Like, wouldn't it be nice to be like them? Look at how happy they are. They must have figured out the secret to living the good life. And before long, they'd abandon God and they would copy their neighbors and it would be a disaster. And there would be suffering and there would be loss and there would be pain. So at the end of the book of Judges, after things just completely spin out and spiral out of control, the final like kind of summary statement for the entire book of Judges is this. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And again, the, the first week of this series, we saw how bad it got. It got, it got nuts. And if you weren't here for that, man, it's a crazy, crazy story. Just misery. Every time they made a decision, they made a mess. And then in an attempt to fix the mess, they just made it worse. And it just got worse and worse and worse and worse and more and more depressing. And then the book ends. Just over. And the author summarizes where things are at. He says, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And the interesting thing about all of it was, it could have been avoided. Joshua had led him into the land, and he'd warned him. He gave him some incredible advice that they unfortunately ignored. But this is such relevant stuff. It was relevant for them, and it's relevant for you and for me, for us. If we would take his words to heart, it could prevent so much heartache. So this comes from the book of Joshua, this happens as he's about to lead them into the promised land, as they are about to begin the period of the judges. He says, he's like, listen. He's like, guys, listen. When you get into the land, when you get settled, when life is good, and, and, and you've got crops that are just bursting, and you've got houses, and you've got flocks and herds, and you have peace from all of your enemies, don't forget the God who made it all happen for you. Don't start looking around at the other nations and trying to be like them. And for heaven's sakes, whatever you do, don't start worshiping their gods. And the people, the people were like, oh man, we would never do that, Joshua. And he's like, really? Joshua's kind of a weird leadership style. He's like, really? I bet you will. I bet you will. You're going to fail. I'll tell you right now you're going to fail. Because this is going to be harder than you think. You're going to get over there, and you're going to start looking around at everybody else, and you're going to think, man, why don't we just be a nation like every other nation? So Joshua's like, guys, I'm telling you right now, you can't be a nation like every other nation. God has something special for you. So here are the final instructions that Joshua gives them right at the end of the book of Joshua. These are the instructions he gives them as he sends them into the land. And these are the instructions that they ignored again and again. And the very reason that they found themselves in such a mess with so much misery. And as we look at the heart behind these words, maybe God would have something for you. Maybe God would have something for me. Here's what Joshua says. He says, don't turn away from him, okay, from God. And cling to the customs of of the survivors of these nations remaining among you. He's like, look, when, when you settle into the land, you're going to have lots of neighboring nations around you. Okay, but keep in mind, they haven't seen what you've seen. They haven't experienced what you've experienced. They don't know what you know. They don't know God like you do. And so they're going to live very differently from you. Don't follow their ways. Don't follow their customs. Don't try to be like them. And whatever you do, don't worship their gods. You're going to be among them, but you need to differentiate yourself from them. You need to be kind to them. You need to show them compassion. That's imperative. Like if they come to you for help, you help them. 
but don't start looking around and trying to be like them. You think your life will be better if you pretty much do what they do, but it won't. He goes on. He says, instead, they will be a snare and a trap to you. A whip for your backs and thorny brambles in your eyes. I don't even know what that means, but it sounds unpleasant. And you will vanish from this good land the Lord your God has given you. The reason you'll be tempted to live like them, he's saying, the reason that you're going to be tempted to live like them is because it's going to look attractive. It's going to seem like it's better. You'll, you'll think that it'll make you happy, but it won't. So he's like, trust me on this. You think it'll give you life, but it's going to end up ruining your life. You think it'll bring freedom. It won't. It's going to make you a slave. And I think we have all had experiences with this. I mean, some of the worst decisions you've ever made were made just like this. You looked around and you saw something attractive, something that looked like it would make you happy, something that other people were doing, and they looked happy to you. And even though there were alarm bells going off inside of you, maybe they were faint, maybe they were going off and they were almost deafening, but you ignored them. Or maybe it was more than alarm bells. Maybe it was an actual person, your mom, going, honey, honey, honey. Uh, 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 uh. Okay, or your dad going, no, no, baby, you can't go out looking like that. You know, maybe it was close friends, but they were, they were saying to you, hey, you better watch out. You better be careful. And you thought, hey, chill. I know what I'm doing. I got this. This is right for me. And the thing that you were show, like so sure was a, a simple expression of your freedom ended up enslaving you in a mess. And maybe it was a substance. Maybe it was a relationship. Maybe it was a sexual thing. Maybe it was a certain way of doing business. Maybe it was taking a crazy risk of some kind. But what started as an expression of freedom ultimately limited your life. And the thing that you were sure would bring you joy, make you come alive, it stole your life. Addiction, rehab, a terrible breakup, a painful divorce, a mountain of debt, bankruptcy. You did what was right in your eyes, and it turned out to be a mess. Joshua says to the people of Israel, guys, God has done so much good for you. He freed you from Egypt. He made you a nation. He made you guys a nation. He, he, he enabled you to overcome nations bigger and wealthier and more powerful than you. He's with you. He's with you and he's providing for you. He's leading you, so be careful. Because if you start looking around at everybody else and you forget about him and you ignore him, it could cost you this land, this good land. This land that God has given you and wants for you. It's like, don't you understand? God is trying to do something extraordinary with you. God is trying to give you something so, so good. And this is the tension that I think is always in play when it comes to our faith. Okay, I've been, I've been walking with Jesus for 25 years. Uh, I became a believer when I was 20. And, and there's this tension that always exists for us. And I know that it's real because it's certainly what I'm experiencing like daily. There are two questions that really frame how I see God and how I see the world. The first one is, is God trying to give, give something good to me? Okay, is God trying to give something good to me? Or is God trying to keep something good from me? For Israel, they continually thought, if we, if we follow God's law, then if we follow God's law, we're going to miss out on something good. And God's going, no, if you obey my law, if you follow me, if you trust me, you're going to miss out on something bad. Yeah, and they're like, yeah, but look at them, and, and look at him, and look at her, and look at all of that. And God's going, I'm telling you, I'm trying, I'm trying to keep something, I'm not trying to keep something good from you. I am trying to give you something good. But as a nation, they just couldn't help themselves, right? They looked around at all the surrounding nations, at all the practices, at all the things that the other people did, 
and they just couldn't help themselves. They said, God, it just feels to us like if we go all in with you, if we follow you, if we obey your law, then we're having to say no to so, so many good things. We just, God, we just can't do it. And see, the way you view the world really depends on how you see God. Is God trying to give something good to me? Or is God trying to keep something good from me? Now for Joshua, this was a no-brainer. Because he'd seen what God had done. He'd lived as a slave in Egypt. He was like the last one alive that had actually lived as a slave in Egypt. He had seen God's goodness. He had understood that in Israel, God was up to something. God was creating a new kind of nation, one that could be like an example to the whole world, one that could be a compass pointing back to a God that's good, a nation that would be filled with justice, where the poor would be cared for, where widows and orphans would never be in want, where neighbor would be kind to neighbor, and where there would always be enough to eat, and where industry would flourish, where families would be whole where brothers and sisters would love each other, where husbands would honor their wives and wives their husbands, where peace would rule. In Israel, they called it shalom. It would be a place where shalom would reign, where crime and injustice would just be a distant memory, where children would be loved and cherished every time. God God wasn't just creating some other nation. God was creating a completely different kind of society, Something that resembled, more than anything else on earth, something that would resemble like the garden, like the kingdom, like heaven. Humanity as God intended. But to experience it, and this was the problem, they couldn't just live like everybody else. So Joshua goes on, he says, Now then, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord the God of Israel. And so as they're moving into the land and they're getting their dorm rooms all set up, he says, if there's anything you own, if there's anything in your life, if there's anything in your closet, if there's anything that you've like stashed under your bed, if there's anything in a box somewhere that's kind of a sort of a, like a just in case, if there's anything in your possession that has the ability to draw you away from your king, away from the king, away from your God, Joshua says, get rid of it. Throw it away. Go to extreme measures, because this is extremely important. And walking away from God is extremely, extremely dangerous. Okay, now, you and I, we face the same tension. We face it every day, the same struggle. Is God trying to give something good to me or is God trying to keep something good from me? And how you see that, of course, shapes everything. If he's trying to give something good to you, then you would want to eliminate anything that would stand in the way of that, right? But if he's trying to keep something good from you, well, then that's that's a completely different deal. You'd want to look around for yourself. You'd want to see what's good. You'd want to decide for yourself. You'd want a little bit of this and a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And you'd want to find people who have what you want, who live the way you think you want to live, and and you'd want to do what they do. But again, I ask, do do you really want to be just like everybody else? Because what if God is offering something extraordinary to you? What if God is inviting you to something different? And then how about this? What if God is trying to give you something better, like a lot better? But what if you have to choose? What if in order to receive what he's trying to give you, you have to throw some things away? What if you'll miss it if you just become like everybody else? So here's the struggle that I have. And um, as I've thought about this and I've, I've wrestled with this, and as I've looked back at the journey that I've been on with God over the last 25 years, this tension exists and it's real and it's, it's hard. And, and I see God's invitation on this, 
honestly. And so often in my life, I look at it and I go, but I don't want to be different. I don't want to be different. Right? Being different means I can't, I can't be a part of things. Things that I think I would want to be a part of. Being different means people will think I'm weird. Right? Being different means I'm going to miss out. And so I, I, I've just over the years have wrestled and wrestled and wrestled with this. And some of you are like, really? And I'm like, yeah. Some of you are like, dude, you're a pastor. Okay, like you made a decision. You're different. You're weird. And I'm like, yeah, okay. I still feel the tension. I still live in this culture. I still have neighbors. And I feel this tension because I'm like, okay, I know Jesus is inviting me to be, be different, but how different? How different should I be? I mean, if I get extreme, if I get like crazy extreme, I'm not going to be able to relate to anybody, right? That'd be a problem. So if I'm going to connect with people, then I got to be like the people, right? And for me, it isn't, it isn't just so much that it's about successful ministry. Um, this might be shocking to some of you, but like, I want to have friends, I actually want to have friends. And not just like weird pastor buddies. I like, I want to have friends, right? Like real friends. Like I want people to like me and I want people to respect me and I want, to pe I want people to feel like they can connect to me. And if I get all crazy weird, if I'm too different, what's going to happen? And my guess is some of you know that tension. Maybe you feel it in your family, maybe at work, maybe with your friends, because they don't follow Jesus, and they, they don't understand. And, and, and so if you're too different, if you just get weird, what's going to happen? I mean, you, you want people to like you, and you want to be able to relate, right? So guys, I just want to say, I totally get it. I get it. And here's, here's like the interesting thing to me about this, okay? We had a little quiz last week. I'm going to see if you guys can do better. Last week, you guys were awful last week. We're going to see if this goes better. Okay, in, in human history, guys, who is the only person to fully embrace everything God had for them? Like, who is the one person that was not ever afraid to be different? Jesus. That was pretty good. One more time. Jesus. Jesus, okay. So what does this look like? It looks like Jesus. In Jesus, we have the only man, the only person in human history that was truly all in all the time. In Jesus, we have someone that wasn't ever trying to just be like everybody else. In Jesus, we see what it looks like to be fully set apart. And yet, here's this really weird thing that I notice about Jesus. People that were nothing like Jesus liked Jesus weird. I mean, have you ever noticed that? Who was it that flocked to Jesus? It was the broken people, right? It was the hurting people. It was the sinful people. It was the messed up people. And it was so weird because in Jesus, they found something. People that were nothing like Jesus liked Jesus. And you know what else is really weird? Jesus liked them back. He liked them back. It's the craziest thing. Jesus is like the holiest man that ever lived, and yet it wasn't really the holy people that connected with him. It turns out that the people were nothing like Jesus, liked him, and he liked them back. And you think about it, why are we still talking about Jesus 2,000 years later? It's because he was never trying to look like everybody else. If he'd just been like everybody else, he would have come and gone and died, and that would have been it. He was different, but he was different in all the right ways. He had compassion. He had understanding. He didn't hate people. He forgave people. He was kind. He was filled with grace and truth. And here's part of the problem in this whole mess, I think. When we think holy, it's not something that's attractive to us at all. When we think holy, we think weird. We think different. And I wonder if it's maybe just because we, we've only really seen horrible examples of it. I mean, we've all seen the crazy, weird religious people, right? 
And if that's what it means to follow Jesus and to get like way into it, who wants it? But what if following Jesus, I'm just throwing this out there, what if following Jesus simply means we look like Jesus? Like if we did that, then something should happen. Something for many of us that would be unexpected. People that are nothing like Jesus, like Jesus. And Jesus liked them back. Like he loved them. So maybe if we looked like Jesus, people that don't like Jesus would like us. Or people that don't like, I messed that up terribly. <laughs> That's what I, sorry. Jesus wasn't like everybody else. Okay, that's the point. Jesus was not like everybody else. And for those that would follow him, he was giving them a pretty hardcore invitation. And he would say over and over in various ways, okay, I'm not inviting you to be like everybody else. I'm inviting you to be like me. And Jesus believed God is up to something. God is up to something among you right now that would blow your mind. Something beautiful. The kingdom of God is at hand, he would say. The kingdom of God is at hand. The, the kingdom of God is present. The kingdom of God is near. And these people that followed him that were broken and hurting and couldn't seem to find their way or their place in the world, they wanted to know, well, okay, but who can participate in that? Who's, who's eligible for the kingdom? And one day Jesus stood and he was talking to this huge crowd on the hillside and he looked at them and he said, blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. See, Jesus looked at this crowd of broken, messed up, sinful nobodies, these peasants, these people that none of the other religious leaders cared about, these people with no spiritual clout, okay, people who were poor in spirit, people who were in mourning, very, very meek people. And he said, the kingdom is right here right now, and it's available. And he, I would imagine him looking at their faces going, it's available to you and to you and to you and to you. And you have to imagine these people going, for me? Yes. Because God is up to something wonderful, and you are all invited to participate. You are all invited to participate. And then he said the weirdest thing. He said, he looks at this group of, I mean, just oddballs, and he says, you are the salt of the earth. Now, salt was used to keep food from going bad, right? It was used to keep food from rotting. In the ancient world, salt was first and foremost a preservative. And Jesus looks at this crowd of nobodies and he says, you are the salt of the earth. Okay, if you participate in what God is doing, you will keep this world from going bad. You will. Your influence in your family your influence and your presence where you work, your presence at school, like on your team, in your neighborhood, together like all of you, when you come together in your town, in your city, in your nation, you can preserve it. You can keep it from going bad. You can keep it from rotting. But then he'd go on and he'd say, to do this, like to really do this, to participate in God's kingdom on earth, to be salt. You can't just live like everybody else. You can't just take your cues from everybody else. So follow me. Live like me. Take your cues from me. Let me make you like me. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? And I guess after wrestling with, with all this stuff for, for 25 years, here's what I've come to realize over and over. The invitation of Jesus is by far and away the best thing that ever happened to me. Now I know some of you are like, I thought Jen was the best thing that ever happened to you. She's not. The invitation of Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to me. And because I said yes to that, he threw in Jen. And I'm like, <laughs> booyah. It's the best thing that's ever happened to me because when I follow Jesus, my heart comes alive. 
When I follow Jesus, my eyes are opened. I see the world differently. When I follow Jesus, it's beautiful. And I like who I am. But more than that, here's what I find interesting. When I follow Jesus, the more I look like him, the more I find people are actually drawn to me. Like, yeah, I, I'm, am I misunderstood sometimes? Of course. I mean, it comes with the territory. Jesus was certainly misunderstood sometimes. But when my life reflects Jesus, when I'm not just trying to be like everybody else, or even worse, be better or do more than everybody else, compete with everybody else, God has used me to do some really cool stuff. And when that stuff is happening, when I see my life having an impact, there's nothing better in the world than that. I wouldn't trade it. I wouldn't trade it for anything. It's a joy that's actually pure and doesn't fade away. And there's no guilt and there's no fear and there's no insecurity. And I have connections with people that are real and authentic and deep. But I gotta choose. And you gotta choose every day. Because to impact the world the way God wants me to impact the world, I can't just be like everybody else. And I just want to close by asking you to think about you. Because you feel this tension. I know you do. And where are you looking around these days going, hey, maybe, maybe I should do a little of that and a little of that and a little of that? Because God's saying, hey, I'm inviting you into something. But you've got to be willing to not try to be like everybody else. And here's the beautiful thing. If you do it, God will begin to use you begin to use you over and over. And I, here's my guess. There's people in your world that need it from you. Your family needs it from you. Your friends at work need it from you. Okay, your friends that you've had for years, they need it from you. Your neighborhood, they need it. But to be that salt and to have that effect wherever you go, you can't just be like everybody else. Father in heaven, I thank you.